Hey, what's going on, Amcon? Here in the studio again, as always, and I'm bringing you a podcast, vlogcast, video, audio thing. I uh, have a special guest in the studio today. Chris is a history teacher, a script writer, a former business owner, entrepreneur. Um, what else? I'm missing something there, Chris. There's something. Published author. Published author. So many things that are relevant, I think, in the context of our conversation, which is about history. And we'll talk about a little bit about media. Mm -hmm. um, we're, let's talk about the journey first. You, you have movies that we'll talk about. We ha you have books that you wrote. There's a whole bunch of things that you've done um, that most people aspire to do in one lifetime, in one career field, and you've done many. How, how did the journey for you begin in all this creative? Well, it's, it started out um, with a love of history. I had a grandpa who used to read a Civil War diary to me um, that was an ancestor of mine, and um, he was a veteran, and you know, that kind of sparked my interest in history. I was always, the past always kind of appealed to me, um, and that kind of led to my getting a college degree in history, um, and then kind of got off of that a little bit and got into screenwriting. I, I didn't know a screenwriter existed until I saw Shane Black interview a guy who wrote Lethal Weapon. And I thought that would be really cool. So I started writing screenplays, actually got an agent in Hollywood, um, had a career that really never went anywhere for a while, kind of gave that back up, got my master's in history. Um, my master's thesis was published by McFarland. It's a Civil War regimental study, the 11th Wisconsin in the Civil War, pretty unique regiment. And um, then kind of got back into screenwriting. I had a movie, movie produced on Netflix called El Camino Christmas, <clears throat> stars Tim Allen, Dax Shepard, um, Visit D'Onofrio, and um, that's been kind of something I've also been doing. So it's, it's been very eclectic. I've been back and forth with history and, and screenwriting and um, kind of keeping those two things together. Now I'm developing a, a Civil War TV series uh, on the book that I wrote. Um, I got other things, but uh, yeah, it's kind of been a unique journey. I've done really two different phases that now kind of are coming together a little bit. When you, when you, let's talk about the, the author piece, because I mean, I'm a, I grew up as a child as a big Civil War buff. Like I just, I appreciated uh, history as well. And you had talked to me about the investigative process of uncovering some of the things that made this book what it is. And a part of it was your own ancestry, mm -hmm. where you're trying to discover who you are. Um, which I think part of one of the reasons I think, I mean, this misalignment of, uh, of history and modern society exists where people are kind of looking for these purposes is they don't even, even understand where they come from. Um, you did this due diligence in, in writing the book. What did you discover in that? Because I know we had talked about there's things that you're uncovering where you're like, man, I not only is this important to tell in history, but this is fascinating as well. Well, yeah, I started with a guy named William, William Henry Ottaker, who was on my mom's side of the family. And um, he was in the 11th Wisconsin, near Platteville. They were recruited in Platteville, Wisconsin, Sauk County, um, Beloit. And so I used that as a starting point, and I went to the Wisconsin State Historical Archives. Yeah. And I unearthed uh, a lot of correspondences, diaries, le uh, letters, um, really a treasure trove. And then the internet, this is in the late 90s, the internet was starting to digitize documents and I found some online. Um, but after a while, I, I accumulated probably over a thousand correspondences. Because um, the Civil War is unique. This, this was a war where the soldiers could write home about anything. They were, they were war correspondents to newspapers. Mm -hmm. And the, this regiment had several. There's a doctor named Henry Strong who wrote home regularly talking about their movements, what they were doing. He'd even criticize them. You know, stuff you could never do in modern military. You'd be, it would be redacted or not even allowed to be sent home. These guys could tell about their movements, where they were going, uh, what they were experiencing. So there's a, really a treasure trove with regard to the Civil War and why there's so many books, because these guys documented so much of it. And they were one of the most literate armies in history. Um, up till that point, uh, you, you didn't find as many educated men in terms of being able to write letters and, and 
and, and articulate what was going on. So that really started the process. Um, <clears throat> and I went to the archives, spent years researching it, uh, found the Daily Journal that you know, they would enter in every day, you know, the, how many men reported for duty, where they were going, where they'd been. And the first time I opened it, I could smell the campfire, you know, where the, this wow. guy who was sitting there doing these entries. And that kind of stuff's really cool to me. And then I, I love the stories of these average guys. These were wheat farmers. Um, 72% of them were, uh, were farmers. But there are still doctors and lawyers and things like that. I love, the, I love reading about the experience of these ordinary guys doing extraordinary things. Mm. And this regiment, you know, it's, it, when we talk about the Civil War, we, we think about, you know, Gettysburg, Lee versus Grant. These guys were on the Trans-Mississippi region. They went up and down the Mississippi. They fought with Grant, actually, at Vicksburg. But they encountered, really, when you talk about, like, for example, my, my screenwriting career, when you talk about pitching a movie, you, you want to give a producer a tone. You want to say it's something meets something. Like if you want to describe the movie Speed, it'd be Die Hard on a Bus. Well, if I was to describe this regiment, it'd be Hard Darkness meets Band of Brothers. You know, it was the, this group of guys that bonded, spent four years together, but encountered really strange things up and down the Mississippi River, all the way down to the Cajun bayous and things. And just move these things you don't hear about or read about in typical Civil War narratives. Um, so there was just that process of really reliving their journey through their, their correspondences. I mean, it was something that raptured me every time I sat down to write. Um, and when I finished the book um, and, you know, typed that last sentence, it was, it, was kind of, it was kind of emotional because I'd finished this journey with these guys. You know, <clears throat> a couple of them went west and fought the Indians, like kind of like Dens of Wolves. Um, but the rest of them went home and tried to rebuild their lives and, re, you know, reestablish, you know, that home life. And, uh, this, you know, the Civil War, things like PTSD didn't just, evolved in the 20th century. These guys back then went home and had to deal with all these issues. I mean, soldiers after the war, they drifted, some of them. Some of them ended up in soldier homes. Some of them ended up in insane asylums. Um, others just drifted west, you know. And, and, but some were able to go home and rebuild the pieces of their lives. But I was always intrigued by that. <clears throat> I was never kind of a military strategy guy. You know, how Robert E. Lee outmaneuvered the Union Army at the wilderness and outflanked them, that's interesting. But to me, I want to know how the soldiers caught in that situation, how they dealt with it. That was always what was appealing to me. You, you, you discovered a lot about your own family genealogy mm -hmm. and, and the origin story. Um, you had talked to me a little bit about the changing of the name during that time coming from Germany of, of, um, uh, into Wainer. Tell, tell us a little bit about that, because I think when, when people now, young people especially, who are listening to professors and teachers in, in a narrow path, often biased path uh, via their own experiences of history, they forget that many cultures, races, human beings from different pasts were coming to America as immigrants and were getting judged and um, uh, often suppressed and oppressed by whoever was in charge, the, the Brits, the French. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Well, you know, immigration and that whole pro obviously we're a country of immigrants. And when I teach this aspect in my, in my history classes, you know, I, right now we seem to stigmatize it with racism and it's all about racism and it's anti, you know, whatever people, um, and it's not racism. That's, is it an element? Sure. But you, you go back to Benjamin Franklin right in the 1760s about the Germans coming to Philadelphia and how that bothered them. Um, you, you look at when Catholics came here, when Irish came here. And after World War I, when my father's side of the family came here, my great-grandfather, there was a huge anti-German sentiment. They, they taught anti-German classes in schools. I mean, the Germans were Huns. You know, they were barbarians. Um, they were Krauts. Well, my last name is pronounced Wiener. And when my great-grandfather got here, to get a job, he had to Americanize his name, change the pronunciation of his name to Wainer, and speak and learn to speak English. And this is a story that was told to me directly. And I don't think there's any immigrants today that have to come here and change the pronunciation of their name or change their name to go get a job. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that we talk about immigration and, and how we are a melting pot society. It's not really about race. It's about nativism who's here, not always open to who's coming. There's, they, whether they view it as a competition or just they don't want any of that additional whatever it is that they don't like. But it's always been an issue with immigration. And, and 
you have to accept the fact that, yeah, there's elements to it more complex than just saying, oh, that's racist, you know, because um, there's all of their different kinds of reasons. To me, you put it in as, as a nativism idea as far as people like Benjamin Franklin not thrilled the Germans are coming. You know, it's just kind of the way it's always been. And I think today we, we jump on that bandwagon too quickly to say, oh, we're just a racist country. We oppress people. You know, um, my great grandfather had to do radical things that would be considered, you know, pretty crazy today to do to just to get a, a job. I, we had talked about specifically Abraham Lincoln in this context because uh, Abraham Lincoln himself was a slave owner, but he was also progressive, right? He was in. I don't a, think I don't think Abraham Lincoln owned slaves. Really? I don't think he ever owned slaves. I heard somebody tell me that. Maybe maybe you'll I, know better than, than I, me. I, I I don't know if, if that's the case. Was he um, considered racist? He was considered racist because he had statements that that. Um, to me, to me, the, the aspect of, of this is we're presentism taking today's understanding of morality or right and wrong or justice and we're imposing on historical figures and um abraham lincoln has some very un some some comments that would, would be picked up as racist frankly um but yet he was a progressive he was a guy who would pass the emancipation proclamation a guy who um, who led the north in a war that would end slavery and um if anyone at that time period could be called progressive, it would be him. To take today's ideals and impose them in the past, I think, creates a very slippery slope when we teach history. If, any of, if you or I were, were, were born in the United States in you know, 1820 or, or you know, even back when the Founding Fathers were creating the nation, we couldn't have helped but been racist in our views of slaves because all we would have known our entire life was an African-American person was a slave. So we would have had those, those prejudices. Um, to expect Abraham Lincoln or a George Washington or Thomas Jefferson to have evolved that quickly and say, oh, you know, we were a racist country, we were fond of racist principles. We were a sexist country, we were, we were fond of sexist principles. Well, we created a republic where people voted at a time when there was kings and queens, when no one was voting. We created a very progressive country. Was it perfect? No, but in the situation that it was created under, uh, the Founding Fathers were... Uh, enlightened, and Abraham Lincoln was enlightened. Um, so you have to accept that they they had they were racist to a degree because there's no way they couldn't have been uh, in that environment that they were raised. It's your it's 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 the you know nature versus nurture. It's all you knew. How can you and how can you expect to not have had that in your mindset? Uh, and the fact that they could approach it and talk about it. the founding fathers really believed slavery was going to die. They 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 knew it wasn't right. They they knew they knew there's issues there. Um, Abraham Lincoln knew slavery was wrong, uh, and he did it. He gently moved the country forward as he could um, to free the slaves. And was it perfect? No, but it was very progressive. And, and the fact that we hear about people wanting to change the names of schools that have his that bear his name or parks uh, because he was a white supremacist is just so uh, obtuse to me. Because again, it's that presentism, you know, mm -hmm. imposing today's. A moral understanding on the past, and we're not. Let's learn from the past. Let's learn what what was going on at that time. Teach slavery. Teach its horrors. Teach everything bad about it. But also these people that came along and gradually saw that it was wrong, and and moved the nation forward as they could in a very progressive way. Um, they need to be, you know, acknowledged for that. Teach everything about them, um, but to say we're going to wipe them from history or remove their name from historical. Um, perspective or from schools or parks or anything to me is is crazy yeah I, I think there's a, a huge conversation that needs to take place <clears throat> about what you're talking about uh, I like the word present presentism right um, because um, it's it's happening all over the world in, in different forms where I mean there's misunderstanding of culture and how tribal we were and how colonial po powers operated um, is a misrepresentation of it's an easy way way to put people in a box because you don't want to have the long conversation about it and just write it off right um i mean when people are calling me alt-right and a white supremacist because i'm i'm going against a marxist ideology or something that i really don't believe in is a, a value of american culture that's so problematic it, it's problematic problematic personally and 
and building relationships and growth as a country. But it's just, it, it's dumb. It's a dumb way of learning from our history. You, you teach history for a living. And you have a curriculum, um, as I understand it, and you follow that guideline in that curriculum, and then you're allowed to deviate, I'm assuming, depending on your experiences and how you shape that story. Are you finding in your experiences that there are um, institutions that are teaching? Uh, we had talked about your institution, and, and you seem very pleased with the, the guidance that you've been given and the path that you've taken. But I know it starts with institutions, teaching young minds, and, and whether they're radical professors or they have radical ideology, is that the start point of why the culture that we live in is being affected? Is that what you see from your institutional pers perspective? Well, I think it's based on the teacher. I, I don't think curriculums are designed right now to be um, slanted. I think there's lots of movement. People want it that way. And I think you both sides could argue that there's been movements that have slanted it a certain way. This is what I'll say is history is a unique subject in that if you look at science, you know, you can, it's very solid. Uh, if you look at, you know, the experiment succeeds or fails. Math, your equation, your answer is wrong or right. Mm. In, you know, English, your grammar is correct or incorrect. In history, it's a very gray subject. Two teachers could teach the same historical event, not tell a lie, but it's how they emphasize certain things over other things, mm. what they leave out. And so a history teacher, a history author, can create a very, I don't say radical, but a very different picture of a historical event than someone else. And so that's where it comes to the perspective part. And so a person's political beliefs um, can definitely sway them in how they teach because they'll, inf they'll overemphasize something and leave something else out. And they can then feel like, well, I've done my job. And I think that's where the problem really is inherited. And I think you see that at all levels. How do you fix something like that? It's human nature. I don't know how you fix it. I think um, you know we are, we we have our biases absolutely. We have our perspective, and you know it's 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 not always reality. It's more just how we perceive it. So I, I <clears throat> I'm going to transition a little bit into your background in script writing because uh, there's a part of me that as I build. Phil Kraft, Survival, American Contingency, and the things that we're doing. I, I don't build it because I want an empire to stand in a robe over other people. I want to build an infrastructure to allow people to tell stories, especially conservatives that I think um, are excluded from the conversation when it comes to media, <clears throat> Hollywood, and just general, just information, period. And that disturbs me. Like if you look at Parler, for example, that's an application that's mm -hmm. pronounced Parlay. They were canceled off of Amazon. Right. Now, I'm not a fan of that. I'm not a fan of, one, the suppression, but I'm not a fan of the application because it's going into an echo chamber. It's creating an echo chamber of no room to grow because you're not engaging with people who aren't like you. Like the first time I went on Parler, I was like, this is all about Trump, all about 2 a I've had enough. Where's the yoga chicks? Where's the the uh, scientist? Where's the other ways of thinking? Mm -hmm. um, because I'm just not that narrowly focused in one dimension. So what I've seen in Hollywood, um, which most people see, is this bias against conservative ideology, whether it's depicting a story in, in war, whether it's telling... Um, you know, a trials and tribulations story. It's all shaped, right? And, and it's all politicized, but it seems to be more liberal, more left than it is conservative. Um, there are movements to do this. Ben Shapiro is starting a media company. We actually started an analog media company. But you have script written and successfully had that picked up and that was turned into a movie uh, starring Tim Allen, Jessica Alba, some popular movie stars. Um, one, how did that? How was that overall experience for you, and and what are the things that you took away from that experience? 
Well, that my movie that came out on Netflix was produced by them. Didn't have any kind of political statement. It was it was it was a story about a, a Vietnam vet um, and his son. Though he doesn't know. Hopefully, people have seen it because it'll kind of blow that. But and they end up in a liquor store in a crazy situation. And becomes kind of a hostage situation on Christmas Eve, and um, you know that movie was easy to get into the arena in Hollywood because it it, it was just a story about a father and a son and and his Vietnam vet and, and his son and um, it became much more than that. Uh, afterwards, but when you're talking about like you know, conservative having a, a viewpoint that promotes what we may, we may say is American idealism or or American ideas, you know, obviously you know Hollywood is going to be a tough sell for that. Um, you know, my movie took twenty over twenty years to get made. It, it's incredibly fucking hard to get anything made in Hollywood, and I would think um, if you add to it the conservative element, darn near impossible. Um, and so you're going to see that kind of, you're going to see less and less of that material coming from that arena. So if, if there is a conservative voice that wants to be heard, it's going to have to spend the money to do it. It's going to have to, there's, and then with all the streaming that's going on with from, you know, Netflix to Amazon to HBO and, and other platforms, you know, there's, there's opportunities there, but then again, is there? Because, you know, who's in charge of those companies? You know, is Amazon going to put on a, a you know, conservative based movie? I, I don't know. Um, you know, so there's, uh, how we work from that, because once again, it's all, it's all about the individuals in charge and what are their viewpoints and what they see is, is, is appropriate for what they want to put out there. Um, so it, it's a slippery slope. <clears throat> and, and for me, you know, process takes a long time. There's so many people that have to say yes to a movie. If you don't have the money yourself, you have to get so many people to say yes. And, and that can take forever, and there's so many times that it falls through. So, you know, it's all about basically having – the system in place to to produce it and then get it out there on, on some kind of streaming platform. But with the internet and with everything that's that's evolving there, I think there's plenty of ways to have a, a voice of your, you know, of your political. And I hate to see even say it like that because I'm a registered independent. I've voted for both Democratic and Republican mm-hmm. presidents. Um, when I, when I teach, I sure hope that I, I do it with a very unbiased um, position. I, I, to me. When you teach history, it's about teaching critical thinking as well and getting you know, people to, to see both sides and, and to come up with their own conclusions. Um, so as far as the, the Hollywood industry, I, I never lived there. It's hurt my career. I could never stand to live there. I visit there all the time. Um, you know, It's just not for me. And I think if I even wanted to have a, more of a screenwriting career, I would have lived there because it is in a relationship-based industry. And you know, if you have, don't have the same views as them, that, those relationships aren't going to be great. And ultimately, you know, that falls apart. Just think about how very few conservative voices in, in Hollywood have been treated. Mm-hmm. You know, um, it's a tough road for that. So yeah, I think if, if we want to tell stories that, you know, sh- talk about American exceptionalism, um, we've got to find our own way and, and really get out there. And, and frankly, the money has to be spent to do it because you're not going to see it in Hollywood um, if that's going to be your agenda is to tell those types of stories. I mean, I, I think the Civil War would be a great topic to talk about now. And, you know, with regard to my book and the story of those guys, and I think it'd be, a, you know, it's timely. But I don't think it fits the current agenda. You know, I'm, you know, my managers and I are having a hard time getting it into places because, you know, they don't want to make a movie about American, you know, exceptionalism. They, they, you know, they want to view, view or take on other topics that I'm not even going to get into. But it's just tough. You know, I, it, it's a tough road for sure. What what are some personal goals and objectives for you in, in this field? Because I mean, like I see like a, like a Civil War book. When I was growing up, Civil War was a hot. I mean, it was it was literally glory. You know, it was like mm-hmm. every movie was a Civil War movie or tied into a Civil War movie. Um, there were Civil War books. You could pick them up off the shelf on the front end. Um, but like you said, it's not it, it's not the current climate for that. So you right now are doing a lot of creative things, trying to get in specific fields to demonstrate some of these things from history. Do you have any current projects that you're working on? And if so, what are they and how do you infiltrate kind of this situation? Yeah, I mean, like I mentioned earlier in my book about the 11th Wisconsin Regiment, uh, I have a, a brand new TV pilot called Rebeldom, and it's about these guys and their journey. You know, and these were... These are wheat farmers primarily who had never left their county in Wisconsin. And they go on this epic journey, um, uh, over 10,000 miles, 
They travel all the way down the Mississippi River into Texas, into Louisiana, and they end up fighting the last significant land battle of the Civil War at Fort Blakely, Alabama. Um, and they actually make that attack with the largest contingent or brigade of African-American soldiers um, who they spoke very highly of in their, in their letters after the, the fight. Um, uh, the the uh, brigade of um, African-Americans uh, were fearless. And, but these guys ex experienced so many things. Uh, I, I think it is a great vehicle to, to teach more than just the Lee versus Grant, you know, the glorified aspects, because war isn't all glory. And these guys experienced a lot of heartache and hardship. And, um, for example, things, have you ever seen a movie where you saw white slaves? These guys end up in Mississippi, and they were horrified when these plantations they came across, the, the, the owners would flee, and they would encounter light-skinned, blue-eyed, uh, blonde-haired slaves. Mm. It horrified them. And the, the, people say, well, the, the Civil War wasn't about slavery. No, for those guys fighting, they, didn't, they weren't going on a mission to liberate slaves. They were trying to unify the nation, protect the Constitution. But you remove the institution of slavery, there is no Civil War. There is no economic issues between North and South. Um, so it was a war about slavery. Just they, at the time, they weren't necessarily visualizing that. Um, so there's all kinds of things. And today, you know, the climate, people talk about civil war, which to me is horrible to even think about that concept. Um, so maybe that topic could be looked at through the eyes of these, these soldiers who went on this epic journey, not really sure what it was about, but at the end, really talking about the conditions in the South and how what they were doing was a good thing. Mm. So how do you, that book right now is, Currently out, yeah. Just they just actually McFarland just released a paperback version of it in October, um, but it, it came out over you know ten years ago. Uh, it was a, my master's thesis, and McFarland is mainly an academic publisher, um, so the book is in libraries and stuff. You won't see it at a Barnes and Noble, uh, but it's on Amazon. You can order it there. Um, but yeah, it, you know, it, it to me, there's topics like that that are very timely. That I don't know if we'll see those in, in movies. Mm. Well, you're working on. The education for script writing too, because I mm -hmm. I think what's cool about I mean, people who teach should have the experiences and the losses and successes through experience to be able to teach, right? Because when you when you have someone who teaches script writing, you at least want them to have a successful uh, go at script writing and understand the processes. And you've been doing some stuff of recent on social media on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, some of it's memes, some of it's educational. But when I, I actually, uh, w at one point in my life, was interested in script writing and, and started writing a script myself. Um, but war and everything else consume me. What is the start point for that? Well, first, what is the, the username of the Instagram page that you're doing? And can you talk to us a little bit about people who are interested in doing that? Because I think if we inspire... In this case, there's a lot of conservatives, but inspire people to get more involved in telling stories and going this route, then it's just not a Hollywood elite thing. It's normal people growing up as in Wisconsin wanting to tell stories and telling that story. Well, my experience, um, I think, has some uniqueness to it because, I, as I said, I never moved to Los Angeles. And most people who get a career, they would say you have to live there. Well, I used the internet to market myself and actually get my first agent. And I started a website in 1995 called ScreenwritersUtopia.com. Um, and I used that as a forum to reach out to agents and managers because they started to use uh, the internet to find writers because at that time there were major in agencies that got all the writers. And so a lot of these independent uh, agents and, and such and producers would use the internet. And I ended up writing, uh, writing a book that Michael Weesey Productions produced, one of the largest um, media publishers, called Screenwriting on the Internet in uh, 2000. And it's, it was my story about how you could research, write, and sell your screenplay on the Internet using that. And so the Internet today can help a, a kid from Wisconsin who can't move to Los Angeles sell a screenplay. There's all kinds of resources online um, to help someone who wants to try to write but can't make that huge leap to go to Los Angeles, and there are viable resources out there to help them uh, learn how to write a screenplay. I've taught classes online for years, and then try to market it and get it exposed to the right people. Um, 
And so that that aspect why you know goes back 20 years. So yeah, we have Instagram screenwriters, screenwriters Utopia. Um, we've got uh, Facebook and we've got um, uh, Twitter. And uh, we just is it still available? Is the website still up? Yeah, it's it's up. It's uh, it's got an archive of um, thousands of of articles and, and stuff on on screenwriting uh, and how tos and things like that. Um, it isn't as updated as, as normally because I'm basically a one man show. Um, doing it, but uh, yeah, it's it's to me it's a treasure trove of, of information how writers can can uh, pick up uh, hints and ideas and, and tips on how to how to write. Uh, my Instagram, we just I kind of send out inspirational stuff and sometimes snippets of educational stuff on you know how to tell a story, how do you start? Because oftentimes it's like how do I even start a story? And you know we sit down and kind of give you know tidbits on that and how you can even begin the process of writing. Because it's, it's, it's overwhelming. Some people are like, I can't write. I'm not a writer. When you can really train yourself to do it, um, there's obviously you have that talent to tell a story in a certain way that's very dramatic and, and will appeal to people. That's the key is you know, learning how to do that. I think it is a learnable um, trade. I think it's, it's an art to a degree. But I also think it's something that most people, if they really studied it, could learn how to do. So what is... What is somebody, I mean, you, you've written books, you did the internet thing early on, actually, the 95, it was like... That was Commodore, pretty early. Yeah, Commodore 2000 days, that was... That was well, I remember, I remember going to, you know, the first Yahoo or whatever, you know, that search engine, I think it was a Stanford, maybe that was Google, but I remember going to the first, you know, some of these first websites, going to Amazon for the first time back, uh, you know, in the day. So, yeah, I was out there pretty early because it was my only venue to try to get myself out there. Uh, and I, my first agent was through a submission. I, I emailed her my screenplay, which actually was El Camino Christmas at the time. It was called Warm Beer. And um, that's how I got my first agent was through an email query, and uh, which is a, basically a, a pitch. You know, hey, re- read my screenplay. It, once you're in that circle, I, I would assume that when you're in that circle, they're referencing uh, successful screenwriters and uh, projects. Do you, are you not tied to that circle, or, or how does that how does that work? Well, you have to you know you have to rely on your agent, your manager to make all those connections, especially if you're not there. Um, you know, th- and they are the ones who would take your material and s- go to a producer or a production company and say, here, you know, you have a prospect here, or we have a you know, a, a, a project, and get it into those those elements. Um, it's very difficult if you don't have that agent or manager. Uh, to to assist you, but it's not impossible. There's all kinds of, of instances where writers have been able to sell their work to a studio, to a producer, who then takes it to a studio. Um, so it's not it's the internet has definitely, I think, helped to open up so many doors to to people who otherwise wouldn't have had that voice to get their material out there. Mm. What do you, let's let's go back and and close out with uh, some historical stuff. You know a lot about history because you teach it in you have an understanding of things that relate to today. And yesterday we were talking about um, George Washington and a lot of the misrepresentation of, again, like the founding fathers and their ideals on uh, America. What do you think, you know, you have George Washington, who was a a commander or or at least a, a lieutenant fighting with the British forces against France. And then... Um, was it turncoat? Is that the when you he was a turncoat? He was considered a turncoat on the on the Brits when he be, when he became G W as we understand him. When when they're fighting this insurgency, um, uh, which I guess, I guess we were the insurgents at the time. A lot of people misrepresent what's happening now in politics as the indications for a resurrection of insurgency to fight this system. And I've educated many people on this in, in different ways, but I just don't see it. I, I haven't put together pieces where I go, this is a tyrannical government. Are they a government Some often misrepresented? Do they make mistakes? Yes, people inherently do. But it, it, when you take all this into consideration and, and knowing history, what do we look at for the criteria to say, okay, now it's time? Because these men 
were fighting for uh, the Constitution. They were fighting for a, a new way of thinking, completely innovating government and, and democracy as we understand it. Um, again, again, against kings and queens, monarchies. But the idea to pick up arms now against our own government because of what they see as, you know, whether it's bad uh, election cycles or bad politicians, is there criteria there for us to go, once this is met, that's the time? I, I can't wrap my head around it, understanding completely h historical references, but it just doesn't seem like it's even close to that yet. Well, I'm, I'm not going to comment on what I think people should do today. I mean, to me, to talk about, like I said before, people about states leaving the Union and all that kind of stuff and civil war is, is dangerous. And But what I will say is this, is that, you know, when the founding fathers created the republic that we, we celebrate now in the Constitution, when they fought for that, they were fighting for an ideal. Um, they wanted, obviously, to get rid of the king, um, the monarchy, and they wanted self-government. Um, you know, you can go back to the Mayflower Compact. You can go back uh, to the fact that we were, I mean, Salutary neglect. The Eng England neglected the, the American colonies, and and we were self-governing really in many in many ways. Um, our own legislative bodies, for example, and uh, we had governors that were you know the British overseers essentially. And when the British started to, the, you know, the, the whole taxation without representation, they were taxing us before they just weren't enforcing them. And so after the French and Indian War, they were in serious debt, and they needed to start recouping that from the colonies, and really rightfully so. They helped protect us from the French and, and the Indians. And um, we didn't really like that because, again, we didn't have representation in Parliament. Um, so we wanted a system that w where we felt like the people were truly re represented. Um, and those are the ideals. As John Adams said many times, you know, we, we need to be a republic of laws, and we need to be lawful. And I think that's a basic premise that people need to also understand today is, yeah, you can be upset, but you have to understand, you have to be lawful in, in, in how you approach that because the, the founders have definitely been about that. Um, you know, you, I've oftentimes talked about the Second Amendment and, you know, the word militia was in there for a purpose. Mm. Um, they didn't believe in, they didn't want a, a, a large standing federal government. They wanted the state militias to handle things. Um, and as far as, you know, that being our last line of defense, um, you know, the founders, to me, I, I, I ask this question. The Second Amendment, as they truly intended it, I think it's been gone for a long time. Um, you, could, you could cite the Civil War. You could cite the Whiskey Rebellion. Uh, when F Washington becomes president, the Pennsylvania farmers were upset over taxes, and what do we do? We march an army down there. Well, a militia to quell an insurrection, essentially. Um, so I question whether or not the Second Amendment, as they truly intended it, because of militias today, and militia is a bad word today. You you don't form militia today. That you're you're going to be under the microscope of the government. Mm -hmm. um, so there's lots of things within that within that that need to be really seriously looked at in terms of, you know, what is it that we, what were our founding principles? You know, and, and you have to start with laws and protections of civil liberties. Um, and so again, it it's it's interesting times um, what people talk about, but. Uh, yeah, hopefully, political discourse today, you go back to the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, Adams versus Washington, very contentious. You know, um, things haven't changed politically between the two-party system and how they fight for power. Um, the Founding Fathers never envisioned how political parties would evolve and become so dominant, uh, at least in my understanding of, of, of that time period. So that's another aspect that the Constitution never really addressed. Um, so, you know, as far as political discourse, they being very, um, very intense, it's always been that way. I mean, before the Civil War, they were beating each other with canes on, on the congressional floor. I mean, there's things that have been going on uh, in politics. And I think we just need to step back and just, you know, we have a great republic. We have a, we have a system. There's a lot going on right now. There's, you know, things that are disconcerting with censorship and, and things like that. I hope, I hope that, uh, that when the dust settles, we can get back to those founding principles. Um, but I do agree that it's, it's, there's concern about things. I feel like you should give, um, <clears throat> with your understanding of history and the take on uh, where we're at today in society, like these mini blocks of content, 
to remind people what the founding fathers principles were because if people forget that in context like if we're if we're even even guys who are considering themselves patriots they read one book and then then they follow that guideline and principle based on somebody's bias but they have a historical reference for all the experiences that you have in educating like hey i don't have to be biased here i don't have to shape anything let me just tell you how it was Mm -hmm. Um, it, it might set people up for a better understanding of how to kind of navigate the world around us. Like we, we talk about that too, how uh, the political divide has always been a divide. That's, that's why it's called essentially politics. Mm-hmm. It's almost synonymous with the word. You, you get that e- e- evo- uh, evoking of the emotion of going, yeah, it's, it's politics. It's a battle, right? Um, I, I, I just I, I agree with what you said. It's so important to keep it within law and order. I mean, people who advocate for violence don't understand, I think, the founding principles of how you succeed in anything mm-hmm. if you get violent. That's the high and right. That's the worst case scenario, and we're, we're nowhere near that. Um, let's talk about some of the uh, resources where people can see what you're doing and, and even get a hold of you if that's possible um, so we could have uh, some follow-ups after this. Well, I have a website for... My production company, warmbeerproductions.com, it kind of goes into projects that I have there. Um, I have the website for writers, screenwritersutopia.com. Um, so those are really the two main elements that uh, um, I'm out there with, and um, you know, easy to contact me through that. They can DM me on the Instagram, right? Yeah, Instagram, uh, Twitter. What's this? What was the IG again? Um, Screenwriters Utopia. Screenwriters Utopia at Screenwriters Utopia. Yeah. On Instagram. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris, for coming on the podcast. Appreciate it. Thank you.